another uh, strange child in that even as a little girl, I was into reading comic books, I was into reading science fiction, um, mythology, legends. I was a voracious reader. I would read anything I get my hands on. I would be at that library every week taking out you know, stacks of books and reading strange stuff. I, I didn't much care for reality and I didn't much care for the, rea the reality that I was in. So I would read um, all kinds of comics, whatever I could get my hands on. I uh, started out reading a lot of Superman, Batman, DC comics, and then when the Marvel comics hit, of course, I went right into reading all of the Marvel comics. I knew where every spinner rack was located in my little hometown, and I would get on my bicycle and ride for miles to go buy comic books. So I, I was a fanatic about comic books, absolute fanatic, and I don't know why, since as a, as a little girl that was considered kind of odd, and my parents tried to make me stop reading them at some point, but that didn't work. So I, I was always, from the beginning, earliest age, I was into reading science fiction, fantasy, comic books, strange and unusual things. I was just into it. I don't, I don't know why. I can't explain it. Um, as a teenager, I was drawing my own comics and I was creating a lot of very strong, kick-ass girl characters. I was really into, I, I created at least a hundred really strong female characters that I wanted to do as comics. Uh, so I, I was always into that for whatever reason. I can't even say why. I would say that I was always a writer, <clears throat> even from the earliest age. I, I recall when I could do nothing but stick figures, I recall that I would do them in sequential storytelling. I would do panels and I would tell stories that way. And I loved reading the funnies and the, the Saturday comics and Sunday comics. I was a born writer, but it took me a long time to figure it out. Um, I got distracted on a path of thinking that I was going to be an artist because I had some minimal drawing ability and my mother was a frustrated artist. So I spent a lot of my teen years and my early 20s mistakenly following this path of trying to be an artist before I finally realized that no, I'm not good enough to be an artist, but you know, I've always been telling stories. I had dozens and dozens of stories and file folders full of stories I wanted to tell. So I finally one day in about my mid-twenties woke up and said, I'm a writer. I've always been a writer. I should be a writer. That's what I should be doing. Getting work in Hollywood is pretty much a matter of who you know, networking, meeting people, making the connections, having a bit of luck. Uh, basically, I started hanging out with a lot of comic book people. I got to know a lot of artists, editors, writers, and started hanging out with those groups of people and becoming friends with them. And through them, uh, it was how I first heard about the fact that Patty Freeling was looking for people. Uh, we're looking for people to do this Fantastic Four show. Uh, so it was a friend saying, hey, they're looking for someone who can do this. And I think all I did was just call up and I got an appointment. Uh, I don't think it's the kind of thing that happens very much nowadays. I suspect it was just a great deal of luck and perhaps the time period at which I was breaking in that I was able to just walk in the door, get an appointment with, with um, David DePatty himself uh, and get a job just like that on the spot. I, having never written an animation script, I didn't even know what an animation script looked like. In fact, uh, at the end of the interview, he said, he asked me, do you know what an animation script is? I said, no, I've never actually seen one. So he said, okay, here. And he, he threw one across the desk at me. And he said, you can use that as, as your guide. And uh, so there I was with one animation script to look at as my guidance and um, started writing. I don't really recall if it was necessarily hard to get started. I think what was hard is that because I didn't know the animation script format, which is, is a bit different than a live action script format, I was studying what this other writer had done with, of course, no clue as to how good the other writer was, but obviously they thought he was good or they wouldn't give me the script. I'm setting this other writer's script and it's all broken out into shots, very specific shots. And I didn't really understand at the time what I was doing fully, but nonetheless I'd say, okay, well, he used this kind of a shot here, so I'll use that kind of a shot there. And well, let's see, he called for this kind of a shot here, so you know, I'll, I'll use that kind of a shot there. And, and I just kind of put it together <laughs> however I could get it to go. I, I guess it may have seemed hard at the time. I don't really remember it being hard at the time. Um, I just loved writing so much anyway that I didn't really much care. It was just, give it to me, let me do it. I would say that I have been extraordinarily lucky in that, for whatever reason, being female has never seemed to 
get in the way of doing what I wanted to do. I can't say that it was been a help or a hindrance. Maybe it was a help in that perhaps I was an oddity and perhaps to some degree it did help and I wasn't really aware of it. Uh, I would say the only bad thing I ever ran into in my career at one point was a case of sexual harassment. Um, but that only occurred once and um, although it did affect me, it certainly did affect me and, and could have put a damper on my career, fortunately um, G.I. Joe came uh, along right after that and um, everything started going great after that. But uh, I've never run into prejudice or I've never run into bias. I've never run into a problem writing hard action material because I was a woman for whatever reason. I guess I was lucky in dealing with the right people. Uh, maybe it was my attitude, <laughs> uh, the fact that I was really into it. Um, for whatever reason, it never got in the way and I never ran into a bias. One of the things I really liked about the people at Sunbow Productions when they were hiring me for G.I. Joe is the fact that I was female seemed to have no consideration whatsoever. It was just, you can write the stuff, great, we'll hire you to write it. And that's the way it was. I had finished writing the five scripts for G.I. Joe and had been working with the Sunbow people for a year or so. So they knew me, they were familiar with my writing, they really liked me a lot, liked my writing a lot. Hasbro came to Griffin Bacall, which was the New York advertising agency that uh, began Sunbow Productions. And just as they did with G.I. Joe, they decided to do an animation series based on this new line of dolls that was going to come out. They had prototypes of the dolls, <clears throat> and so they, they came to me to do all of the development. And I think because the people at Sunbow knew me so well, they knew that I could write action, but at the same time, I was female, and this was very much a girl-oriented show, so it was obvious that they wanted a female writer, but at the same time, someone who could handle these other requirements, which, which I will get to in a minute, because it had some very specific requirements. So they wanted a female writer that could do this, but at the same time, someone who knew how to do action adventure. Um, I forget exactly who contacted me. I, I think it might have been Carol Weitzman. It might have been uh, Jay Bacall, who I worked with very closely as the producer. And uh, Jay was a wonderful guy to deal with, wonderful. But I remember they came to me and they said, uh, there's going to be this, this line of dolls, and it's called Jim and the Holograms, and it's about a good girl rock group and a bad girl rock group that are in competition with each other, and we would like you to develop it and, and do this series. And I went, yeah, wow, cool, great. And they went away and I, I sat there very quietly to myself and I thought, how am I gonna do this? This is so soft. It's so girly. It's like, you know, I've just been doing G.I. Joe. And, and really, literally, I, I, I was thinking, it's so soft. How am I gonna do this? Once I got into it, I loved it. I really loved it. I really, really got into it. But at first, coming from such a hard action background, I, I really was wondering like, ooh, I don't know. Am I gonna be any good at this? And they had a, a rather conflicting set of requirements. At the time that Jim first ran, it was only running in like 11 minute segments. And it was in a half hour, it was bracketed up front by, I'm trying to remember the other shows, I think in Humanoids or something like that, and then Jim, and then some other boy show. I forget what they were, you know, like robot shows or whatever they were. And then there's Jim stuck right in the middle. And so they, they were saying to me, this is a girl's show. It has to have romance and fashion and glamour and you know, all this, this girl stuff. But we firmly believe the boys are going to be controlling the dial, so that means it's going to have to have all these action elements so that the boys won't change the dial. So they're giving me these really conflicting ideas about what they want this show to be. So it was, it was a very interesting challenge to come up with something that was going to satisfy the, the girl element and keep the boys from changing the dial. And so that was what I was working with at first. And so for me it was great coming from the action adventure background because it meant I could keep that thread of action in there and then just lay these wonderful soap opera elements on top of it. And so for me that was just a tremendous amount of fun. They, uh, they showed me Polaroids of the dolls and they gave me the, the trademark name like uh, Jim. Jerrica, Pizzazz, Kimber, they said they're rock groups playing such and such instruments. They have this holographic computer 
called Synergy and these earrings, and that's how she's going to change her identity. She has a boyfriend named Rio, and she's going to have this roadster. And so that was what they gave me. Those were the parameters, and then I got to create everything else. You know, the, the full names, the full backgrounds, the biographies, the setup, the Starlight Foundation, the Starlight Girls, the villain, you know, all of that. I got to create all of that and put that all together. So that was my role was actually developing that, creating all of that, and putting it all together so that we could do 65 half hours and, and never run out of ideas. This was the uh, first time I had been able to develop something myself. Everything else I'd ever worked on, of course, was either existing characters like Spider-Man or someone else had created the series, as in the case of G.I. Joe. So this was my opportunity to actually take just these basic elements and do all the creative work. And I loved it. I absolutely loved that. I loved that more than anything I could possibly say. And the fact that I had such a large degree of creative control just meant that I could satisfy everything I wanted to do with it. I could satisfy what I wanted to do with the characters, with the amount of action, you know, how I wanted to set up this love triangle, how I wanted to set up the friendships. Um, it, it was just a dream project. It really was. And the more I got into the, the soap opera elements, the more I discovered I really liked it. It was simply something I had never worked with before. But once I did start working with it, I, I really enjoyed it. I just found that there was a lot of fun here. There was a lot to play with, a, a lot you could do with it. So it, it, it got me beyond being just an action writer. It got me more into the uh, character-driven elements. Gem was based entirely on the toy line, on, on what they had. Um, well, no, I tell a lie, because I did have to create the villain, Eric Raymond. The joke behind the villain, by the way, is uh, this is another case of Tuckerizing, where you take a friend or a family and, and you turn them into a character, including using some aspect of their name. My poor brother became the villain. <laughs> My brother's uh, first and middle name is Eric Raymond. So I created the villain character named Eric Raymond, so he's had to live with that all these years. <laughs> um, I certainly did some of that. I, um, I did that with my father. I turned him into a character in one of the episodes. But basically speaking, as far as the major characters go, they were all based on specifically on the dolls. Now, initially, uh, at the very, very beginning, she wasn't called Jem. She was called M, just the letter M which I thought was great because you can have M stands for music, for magic, for mystery, with all these things you could play off of that, but then they realized you could not trademark or copyright a letter of the alphabet, so she went from being M and Morgan, the original name, to being Jem and Jerrica. So those, those are the kind of changes that happened from a product standpoint. But basically, all I had were, these are the dolls, this is what the dolls look like, go forth and, and create all the rest of it. Um, the only original things I could create were the villain and, say, the Starlight Girls, some of which did get turned into dolls later on. Um, but for the most part, we already had a pretty large cast of characters to deal with. I never really sat down and said to myself, Jam or any of these other characters are going to be based on an existing pop star of any sort. I didn't think about it that way. I, I was thinking just in terms of creating original and interesting characters. So I did not base any of the characters that I created on any existing or specific pop star at all. There was a very specific guideline that every episode was going to contain three songs. And every act of the three acts was going to have one of these music videos in it. So there was obviously a certain amount of MTV influence in that they wanted to have the music videos. And of course the music was a very significant part of the show very important part of the show and I think one of the great reasons for its, its success is that we had such fantastic music. We had wonderful people creating the songs and writing the music and uh, the fans still to this day are just you know, crazy about the music, love the music, as well as loving the dolls and loving the animation series and the characters. Uh, music was certainly a very significant part of it and when we wrote the scripts we had a mandate that Somewhere within each of these acts, we were going to find, have to find a spot and we are going to have one of these music videos. So that was a very, very specific part of the script writing process. And uh, the writer's job was to say, okay, 
here in this spot, it's going to work really well to have a music video. Describe what the basic idea of the video was, what the basic action of the video was, maybe suggest a little bit about what the lyrics should be about. And then, and then, um, then it was up to the people to go off and write the lyrics and do the storyboard, the actual sequence of it. Um, so from that point of view, that was probably the major impact that something like MTV would have had. It's the fact that there was so much emphasis on the music and on the music videos. The music was all done in New York. Um, there was, I believe, as I recall, there was a writing team that did uh, the lyrics and the songwriting. Um, and there are quite a number of people that did the actual performing. And I believe it was all done in New York. I never had anything to do with the music or the creation of the music. I didn't write lyrics. Mainly all I did in the script was indicate this is what the song is about. This is, this is the moment that the song is covering, or these are the emotions, or this is the thought, this is, this is what we want to get across in this particular video. And then it was up to this team to come up with the actual lyrics to convey that. I would love to see Jim come back. I would love to do it again. Uh, if it comes back and I'm not involved, that would not be fun. <laughs> but uh, it would obviously have to be updated a lot. And that means, do you just take those characters and update them, or do you create a whole new batch of characters? So there's, there's a couple of different ways you could go. But I would love to see it done again, but you know, it's not up to me, unfortunately.